near you. We have located Jesse Simonton from On3.com covering the world of college football. What a world it is to cover right now. Uh, Jesse, appreciate the time. How are you? I'm doing well, guys. It's, it's certainly been a whirlwind. Certainly been a whirlwind. It, it feels like the season barely ended and the offseason has just cranked up to, to a nine. So the story is Nick Saban's retiring, but what's the story to you? What, what does this mean in terms of the impact on Alabama, what we're seeing, and then also the potential impact of those around Alabama who have been waiting on this this day or this time to come for so long? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been kind of a seismic earthquake, right? I mean, it's that, that Saban retiring, I think, has been the biggest college football story of my lifetime just because of what he's done in this sport, you're talking about a guy who signed 10 number one ranked recruiting classes. He is the recruiting godfather. He then parlayed that success into seven national championships, six with Alabama, completely, you know, uh, rebuilt the tide to, to the image uh, of Bear Bryant and, in, and arguably better because the sport was way more competitive. He had to, you know, navigate around all sorts of rules. You know, I, I said this the day that he retired on a uh, Andy Staples show, you know, I think what's most impressive, you can rattle off kind of the Saban stats, but what's most impressive is that this is a guy who not only was an innovator with the pattern match scheme and, and what he did defensively, but he was his ability to adapt and mold and, and the evolution of his program from where it started to when he got there in 07 to where it was when he left it, it's remarkable. And now we are seeing the ripple effects of, you know, what the SEC and what college football looks like in a savingless world. And Alabama suddenly looks, uh, you know, mortal. And I, and when, you know, I think their fans are maybe realizing it wasn't necessarily that, that, that Crest A or the big Tide, you know, brand that was making that program. It was Nick Saban. And when you take that, you know, out of the equation, these guys don't know who Kalen DeBoer is. They can't, and that's not Kalen DeBoer's fault, but these guys c- couldn't pick him out of a lineup seven days ago. And so when they signed up uh, to play for Nick Saban, you're now seeing the cost of that. What, what teams do you think uh, are in position to close the gap, to make uh, a move now that Nick Saban has gone and Alabama has suffered some attrition? What teams – um, have already done a really good job of that. And what teams do you think need to do a better job of uh, jockeying for position and making making a move? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Jason. I, I do think that Georgia is best positioned uh, just because of how, how far ahead they already were. You know, they were already running neck and neck. They've won two titles in a row. So I think they just, you know, firmly slide into that top spot. And then there's really going to be some jockeying for who can kind of leapfrog Alabama uh, in this power vacuum that's happening. I have a column in on three right now kind of talking about LSU's opportunity. They got the number one ranked recruiting class in 2025 already, the top quarterback in Underwood, the number one receiver, number one running back. Brian Kelly seems to have kind of uh, bought himself some more goodwill after, frankly, uh, I think a wasted season in Baton Rouge where you have a guy who wins a Heisman Trophy, but your defense is so bad, you're not really competing for the SEC. He's clean house defensively. He's hired some really good coaches. So I think LSU is in that camp. I think uh, Texas, certainly. But we'll see kind of how they adjust to playing in the SEC. And then where you guys are in Knoxville. I mean, I think Tennessee has an opportunity alongside Auburn if they can kind of continue to recruit. With Hugh Freeze, it's going to be about the quarterback. Who can he kind of surround all these five-star receivers that he's landed? Um, and, and with Tennessee, it's, you know, how does Heifel kind of continue to build out his staff, I think, uh, and evolve to where it's not just about scheme, which is kind of the same thing, I think, frankly, that Al- Alabama is going to be up against with Kalen DeBoer. It's having some killers on your staff who can recruit. And Tennessee has recruited well. He, I, I noted this, uh, you know, the day that Kalen DeBoer got hired, that, you know, you can kind of see some similarities there with Josh Heupel. Can he be better than he was at Washington? Heupel has been a much better recruiter at Tennessee than he was at U- U- uh, UCF. But now you got to take that leap. Top 10, top 12 is good. But if you want to compete for a championship, championships on an annual basis, you got to find your way into that top five. It's a talent acquisition game. We know that. Um, and I think it's just become more and more magnified as we kind of progress in, in the new landscape of college football. 
We're talking to Jesse Simonton. He covers college football for on3.com. So is that the next step for Tennessee if they want to get where you you know the Vols want to go? And uh, what would you add to that as you've seen Nico make his first start for Tennessee against Iowa in the Citrus Bowl, and they're going to try to build around what he can do at quarterback heading into 2024? Yeah, there, I mean, there should be a lot of excitement around uh, Nico. And, and, you know, I've joked on, on several radio and TV uh, appearances that, you know, I think the biggest thing for him between now and, and the season is probably just gaining 20 pounds because if you're going to run them how they did, and I do think that Heifel kind of found maybe something, uh, maybe kind of a, a little secret elixir to kind of mix in with his, you know, run and shoot Baylor offshoot offense is to have that, you know, wheels at the quarterback position, even more so maybe than what Hendon did a couple of years ago. Um, but that means Nico's going to take a pounding. So I do think he probably needs uh, to put on a little beef there. Tennessee's going to be fine offensively. They're always going to be fine. It's kind of, can you take that step defensively, which they did last year, I thought. I thought, you know, under Tim Banks, they made some strides. You got one of the best pass rushers, if not the best pass rusher in the SEC. Um, how do you kind of evolve around them? I like what they've done in the transfer portal. You know, they, they haven't gotten maybe some of the acclaim of the old misses and the Louisville's uh, of the world, but Tennessee's done a nice job there. If they do end up landing the LSU offensive tackle, I think that would be huge, uh, especially because you're kind of pairing the young player with Nico's timeline, which I think would be important. The next step, Josh, is, is again, they got to continue to recruit. You, you got to recruit dogs, uh, and, and that's what it's going to be about because I think what we're going to see in this 12-team playoff there's going to be more schools, and fan, fans are going to appreciate this, I guess. Uh, there's going to be more schools that have an opportunity, so to speak, to play for an, or compete for a national championship. What I think you're going to find is actually the field is really going to shrink who can win it. And it's already a short number each year, but now we're talking about teams maybe having to play 17 games. Only the best rosters are going to be able to withstand that sort of uh, you know, attrition, so to speak, with injuries transfer portal, uh, you know, what have you. And so can Tennessee now level up? I think that's going to be the question. Yeah, you don't have to be perfect or at least close to it like you felt like in a two-team or a four-team, but you have to hold up. And that that comes back to depth, which still comes back to recruiting, transfer portal. Uh, You mentioned Ole Miss. What do you make of the offseason for Lane, for that program? Uh, We're starting to get people kind of upset when – that name comes up on this show because of all the attention that it's gotten, but it's gotten that attention for a reason. Yeah. I think what you're going to see, I think what you're seeing with Ole Miss uh, is frankly, Ole Miss is not going to be able to compete annually for the SEC championship or even for a college football playoff. Uh, But Ole Miss, Missouri, I think is going to be in a similar camp this next season. Uh, You maybe parlay your success from that. You just had both of them had double digit win seasons. And then you kind of, say, hey, we have a veteran roster. We got all these guys coming back. Let's push our chips in. So you have the Grove Collective, you know, raise all this money. Um, Lane suddenly can't complain that, you know, they're not spending enough because when you're paying for the Walter Nolans of the world, uh, you're spending plenty. And and so what do you do? You you push your chips into the table, and that's what Ole Miss is doing. Um, And so I I think they're going to be ranked in the top ten to start the season. Now, it's honestly, guys, it's going to be about Lane doing what he hasn't really done, which is deal with expectations and be the hunted instead of the hunter. It's easy to poke and prod and kind of troll uh, when you're not burdened, you know, with that albatross of, hey, I'm a top five, top ten team, and we got to, we have to go out there and win. Lane's done a nice job of winning uh, when the expectations have been low. Now it's going to be about, all right, yeah, we, we got that big number next to our name. Can we now beat the Alabama when we're favored? Can we go, you know, into Baton Rouge and win? That's going to be the question for Ole Miss in 2024. Jesse Simonson on 3.com. Your 50,000-foot perspective here, understanding how important X's and O's is and putting guys in position to be successful, but recruiting is king and always will be in this conference. Outside of Georgia staff, who do you think, in the SEC, best recruiting staff from your point of view? Uh, I mean, it's it's hard not to, to, to like what, you know, uh, LSU's done. Uh, you know, the fact that they've added Bo Davis. Um, 
you know, their quarterback's coach. I mean, they don't even have an offensive coordinator, and he signed the number one quarterback in the country. So that's uh, that's rather impressive. Um, you're also talking about them being a, in, in a talent-rich state. I think Texas has a very good recruiting class. Texas also, um, you know, and we'd be naive not to factor this in, Texas has a very good collective, and, and that is uh, an important equation. Hugh, you know, Hugh Freeze at, at Auburn there, has never been shy um, about going after the biggest guys, and now Auburn's been able to land them. You know, they're much more, I think, unified there uh, on the Plains. You know, again, they don't have a quarterback at Auburn, and yet they signed all these five-star receivers. So they, they got to be banging on something uh, to, to, to come down the pike there. So I would say those are the best recruiting staffs. Tennessee kind of slides in after that. Florida's right there, probably right around where Tennessee is. Um, Billy Napier is a, is, a, is, a, is probably one of the better, you know, head coaches, uh, recruiters. And then it's kind of, you know, what can you do with the staff around you? So, again, you, you, pick, you pick at the top 10, top 15 rankings, and that just shows you how it's a dog-eat-dog dog world in the SEC because I just rattled off about six teams, and they're all right there, you know, in that top 10, 11 teams in the, in, in the country. Hey, uh, last thing, we'll get you out of here, Jesse, and this answer may not be able to hold up long because it's a minute-by-minute minute thing. Is Jim Harbaugh going to go to the NFL? Is he going to stay at Michigan? What's the deal there? So I had a bold predictions piece uh, that I ran um, in late August, and then I did kind of a, a revisited piece uh, that just ran earlier this week. And the one thing that hasn't happened yet was I did a two-part Michigan deal. I was right that I said they'd be the number one seed in the college football playoff. Uh, I did not predict them to win the national championship. I actually still had Georgia winning the national championship. But in that prediction, I also had this being Jim Harbaugh's last season. So I'm going to continue to say that I think he uh, exits stage left, especially the fact that he's delivered his alma mater, a national championship. You have whatever's going to happen with the NCAA. Uh, and then it's up to us, guys. Uh, not, not up to us, but we're, we're, we then wait to see, is it going to be another feeding frenzy on Michigan's roster? Uh, if they go outside of the walls and don't hire Sharon Moore, Jason's hoping for chaos. You know, I'm hoping for a streamline. Hey, promote Sharon Moore and 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 let's uh let's kind of slow this carousel down a little bit. Yeah, Sw- Swain has Michigan. just been shameful with his activity, as you can imagine, Jesse. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah, Tennessee, I'm sure, would have, have <laughs> several guys circled on that uh, yeah. the LSU or, or Michigan roster if there, if there's some uh some major moves there. Yep. Uh, you can guess as well why Swain's maybe looking for a little more chaos. Jesse exactly. Simonton on 3.com. You can read his work, working with Andy Staples. Check them out as well. Beard's looking great. Jesse, we appreciate you hopping Thanks, on the guys. show. Jealous. And uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, boys. Jesse Simonton covering the world of college football for On 3.